Hi everyone, my name is Katie Dagan and I'm going to be talking about some machine learning projects with CESM. So I want to kind of set the stage for discussing machine learning and some applications to climate modeling. Um, but first by kind of defining some of the terms that you might hear interchangeably. Uh, so the figure in the top left is kind of a nice way of outlining these different terms. Um, starting with artificial intelligence, which is kind of a broad term that refers to programs that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. And then defining machine learning as a subset of that, uh, really thinking about algorithms uh, whose performance improves as they are exposed to more data over time. And then deep learning being a further subset of machine learning. Uh, which really refers to using specific architectures like multi-layer neural networks. Um, and the other uh, sort of point that I want to make before we get started is uh, that AI and machine learning uh, is not always neutral just because it's based on math and statistics. Uh, and we know that data and algorithms can reinforce society's prejudices. So it's really important for the human programmers to uh, ensure that the AI and machine learning algorithms we're developing are not biased. And there's lots of great reading on this topic if you're interested in learning more. Um, but specific to climate modeling and earth science, uh, there, there are applications that we can see where we can kind of take common machine learning tasks that have a lot to do with usually image, uh, processing and um, recognition and video prediction and things like that and actually see how they can be applied to different earth science tasks. So this is a nice paper that kind of goes through um, that motivation in more detail. So today I'm going to talk about two different applications of using machine learning for climate modeling really to try to answer the question can machine learning contribute to climate modeling. And the first project that I'm going to talk about has to do with understanding climate model uncertainty. So we know that we can use climate models to study future climate changes. I'm showing here a figure from the IPCC uh, showing simulated modeled historical global average surface temperatures and then projected temperature changes uh, out to the end of the century from sort of a high and a low emissions scenario. Uh, but we can see that model spread introduces some uncertainty in the predictions. So the shading is sort of encompassing all of the different models, 30 something models that were used for these different scenarios. And we can see that they produce overall sort of generally the same answer, but with some spread in those predictions. And so the question is, where does that uncertainty come from? Uh, and the short answer is Earth system models are very complicated and they're trying to uh, parameterize and represent lots of different processes. And so this is a kind of a nice figure uh, from Bonin and Doni looking at the variety of processes that are trying to be represented by an Earth system model. Uh, and it gets very complicated very quickly um, some of these processes we don't have complete observations or perfect, you know, theoretical understanding to inform the equations that actually go into models. Uh, and so that leads to different representations in different models. So for this first application, I'm going to zoom in on the land model component of CESM. So we're going to talk a bit more detail about processes in uh, the land model, CLM and in particular parameters in the land model. So what do I mean by parameters? Uh, this is just a schematic showing the different processes that are represented by CLM. And you can think of parameters as sort of um, model, you know, part components of model equations that are used to represent these different processes. For example, representing uh, transpiration or the flux of water through vegetation. Uh, all of these processes have fundamental equations and they all include different parameters, uh, some of which there is uncertainty on uh, the exact values that are used. 
And when we try to understand the uncertainty that comes from those parameter values and try to adjust the model to better represent those processes, it can kind of uh, be a very complicated process and it takes a long time. It takes a lot of model runs and a lot of trial and error. It almost turns into like a game of whack-a-mole where you fix a particular parameter or a particular process and then it sort of makes something else worse. So this sort of becomes this winding path to try and improve the model representation and reduce the uncertainty. So the motivation for this project was, can we use machine learning to sort of streamline this process of uh, parameter calibration and um, uncertainty quantification from uh, processes in the land model? And so the overall uh, setup for this work uh, was to train a particular machine learning algorithm, an artificial neural network, to act as an emulator for uh, the community land model. So the inputs to the emulator would be those sensitive parameter values uh, determined by sort of running sensitivity tests with CLM. Uh, and then the neural network would be trained to emulate uh, the output of the model in response to sort of changing those different parameter values. And really what this allowed us to do was run many fast computations with different parameter values. Um, and just to sort of really emphasize that computational savings, um, just to compare the two different methods. So starting from running the full land model uh, with different perturbed parameter values, at least in the configuration that I was using, it took about two hours per simulation. Of course, that depends on choices like resolution and complexity, uh, but just sort of taking that as the baseline, uh, after training a machine learning emulator to replicate the output of CLM, that took seconds to generate predictions. So you could really see how the computational efficiency is increased here, and it allows us to test lots of different parameter values uh, much more quickly than running the full model. And so what we're able to do then is kind of take this emulate calibrate test approach. So on the left, I'm showing a representation of the skill of the emulator. So sort of comparing the predictions from the neural network on the y-axis with the actual model output. And so what we're able to do is assess the skill by sort of comparing are these predictions lining up with the model output for a variety of, of different metrics. Uh, here I'm just showing as an example the first principal component of gross primary production. Um, but there um, were a variety of metrics that we can sort of define for this problem. And then once we have a well-trained emulator, we can then bring in observations and ask the question, can the emulator produce the best fit parameter values to observations? in order to reduce the model biases. Uh, and so on the right, I'm showing a comparison of the model with default parameters relative to observations, and then once we've calibrated parameters. Um, so there's a lot of complexity that goes into this, and if you're interested in more details, you can find them uh, in this paper that came out last year. Um, but overall, we're able to increase the computational efficiency of the parameter calibration approach and also try and reduce some of these biases that exist um, in the model as we know it. So the second application that I'm going to talk about has to do with detecting extreme events. And here we're going to switch over to focus on the atmosphere model component, CAM. And the motivation here is really that we know that extreme precipitation in particular has significant consequences. So I'm showing uh, a couple examples of uh, damage after extreme events. For example, the Oroville Dam overflowing uh, following an atmospheric river event in California on the left, and then on the right, flooding uh, in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. Uh, and so that also sort of leads us to the point that extreme precipitation comes from many different sources. So understanding the different sources as well as uh, the impacts uh, is important. 
And for this work, we're leveraging uh, some work that's been done to detect, automatically detect extreme events in climate model output. And so what I'm showing here is uh, image recognition for detecting extreme events. We're using a project uh, developed by Berkeley Lab uh, called ClimateNet. And this project leveraged expert labels of tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers, uh, where experts, scientists actually went in and labeled, hand labeled these events and in different you know, snapshots of climate model output. And this data provided a training data set for training a machine learning algorithm to automatically detect these types of events, uh, in particular focusing on atmospheric rivers and tropical cyclones. And there's lots more details in this paper if you're interested in how this sort of data set was generated. So what we've done is apply these algorithms to uh, CESM model output to automatically detect these different weather features. So on the left, I'm showing an example of detecting atmospheric rivers in red and tropical cyclones in green uh, in the climate model output, in CESM output. These are global high resolution simulations. Uh, and on the right, I'm showing a different algorithm that was trained specifically to detect fronts and to detect different front types in climate model output. Uh, and this particular domain is just over North America, but we're also able to successfully sort of distinguish these features from the CESM output. So there's lots of interesting ways that we can uh, apply this work. In particular, we're looking at how to validate the results that come out of the algorithms, sort of uh, alluding back to my first point about building confidence and trust and ensuring that the algorithms aren't biased. So in the top right, I'm showing comparing the results from CESM in orange to an observational data set of fronts in blue, sort of validate that we're getting the right um, representation of these fronts uh, in the model. We're also looking at developing additional algorithms for additional types of extreme events like mesoscale convective systems, or MCS. And so here's a schematic from Maria Molina, who's working on that uh, design. And then finally, we'd like to be able to connect the detected features to extreme precipitation. So here's an example of looking at CESM extreme precipitation, so 90th percentile precipitation, along with detected fronts, and sort of being able to line up where the extreme precipitation is likely originating from a front versus another type of event. And so I just want to end with a few sort of summary slides. First being, you know, we know there's lots of challenges to research with machine learning. Uh, I didn't really have time to talk about it, but, you know, the whole idea of interpretability, so not just using machine learning as a black box, um, but there's all sorts of other challenges having to do with uh, uh, obtaining high quality training data, uh, working in sort of physical constraints to models, working with big data. Um, but there's lots of opportunities as well, both sort of from an interdisciplinary science perspective um, and also just different science questions that we can apply machine learning to. I also wanted to include uh, a variety of online learning and workshop opportunities. These slides will be posted on the tutorial website, so you'll have access to these links. But if you're interested um, in learning more about machine learning for climate, for earth science, there's a lot of really great resources out there uh, and also you know, upcoming uh, tutorials and workshops. So just to summarize, we talked about two different applications of machine learning for climate modeling for CESM. Uh, the first being training an emulator to reproduce land model output with greater computational efficiency. This is then used to calibrate model parameters and uh, minimize error between the model and observations. And the second was using machine learning detection algorithms to capture high impact weather events uh, and connect those to extreme precipitation. And for that work, we're still thinking about validation and interpretation in order to build confidence in our predictions. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to mention there's a variety of other CESM-related machine learning projects going on. 
These are only a few examples. Um, thinking about machine learning for Earth system predictability, uh, thinking about uh, different parameterizations, uh, using machine learning for different model parameterizations, for example, in CAM6 and MOM6. There's also work uh, going on in the sea ice modeling component. Um, so lots of different applications across the different components of CESM. So thanks very much for your attention, and if you have questions, uh, this is how to contact me.